Great. I think everyone so far is in. So hello, everybody. Um, and welcome to the Manitos Metadata Platica session two. Um, I am going to uh, read a brief land acknowledgement and then introduce our participants today. Um, one thing I will ask for everybody is if you do have questions, and I do hope you do have questions because we all have a Q&A at the end, feel free to put them in the chat and we will answer them at the end. Um, and and uh, so that's how we'll be handling questions today. So, um, and uh, I do this land acknowledgement for Highlands because this is kind of a Highlands-based project. So that's seems to make sense to me, even though we're in a virtual place. Um, so I acknowledge that we are on the ancestral territories of the Tenoan tribes, including the Northern Tiwa Pueblos, the Apache, the Comanche, the Kiowa, and the Diné. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and we recognize these peoples were displaced to accommodate others in the name of progress. With humility, we recognize and respect these indigenous peoples, their histories, and their ties to the land. So uh, just wanted to do that land acknowledgement. And now I am going to turn this over to Amy Winter, who is the Manitos Project's uh, Omika S specialist, uh, and also to Nancy Montoya of the uh, Manal Historical Library of the Southwest, who will be doing your program today. So take it away. Thanks, James. That's awesome. Um, Hi, again, I see some people that I recognize from the last time. And thank you everyone for coming. I wanna apologize because I am having a pretty bad allergic reaction to the smoke here in Albuquerque. So I'm not crying, I'm just <laughs> dripping. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so how I wanted to roll today was to um, revisit a couple things quickly that we talked about the last time and then jump in and talk with Nancy because she has some really cool um, kind of example, real world examples um, that she's come across in her work that I think can inform how we want to do our work moving forward. Um, so just quickly in the chat, I put a couple of links. The first link is to um, a page about metadata on my website, but that doesn't matter. It could be anywhere. Um, and I don't want to go into it a lot because I talked about it in the last chat, but I do just want to point out because I forgot the last time that there are some links to some forms and such in this post. So here is a basically just a, a reformatted um, list of the Dublin core fields that are also down here in the post. And it's, it's basically just this, but it's like a print friendly format. Um, and then we have a form that has the fields and also has space to write or type in the information in case you are going out into the field. Let's say you can print a bunch of these and fill them out when you talk to people or when you do an oral history and fill in your metadata at the same time. And the other thing that I wanted to share is this is a spreadsheet and that is the second link in the chat as well. Um, and this spreadsheet has the Dublin core fields across the top and then it has the description of them in this gray bar. And then it has an example. And this example is from the Library of Congress and there's the link to it right here if you wanted to go and actually look at the image. And then right here, is where you can start filling in your own items if you want to use this to start to create your metadata for the items that you already have. Um, and that sheet, you can't edit this one, but you can click file and download it. And then you have your own copy and you can fill it out. And if you, yeah, if none of those options work for you, then you can email me or send me a, a message through my site and we can arrange to get you a copy of it if the download formats aren't working. So I just wanted to um, mention those resources. And if we need to, we can talk about that more in the Q&A. But now I want to switch over to Nancy and show you, uh, while she's talking, I can pull up some of her, I hope I can. <laughs> um, here it is. Can, uh, is that visible? 
No, uh, we're just seeing oh. this still. How's that? No. no. Oh, there we go. So, okay. Yeah, sometimes it takes a minute for it to catch up to me. <laughs> so these are um, some documents that Nancy has that she's going to talk about, and then um, you know we'll just go from there. So Nancy, yay! Hi, so hi much. everyone. I'm uh, Nancy Montoya. I'm a volunteer at the Manal Historical Library of the Southwest. Um, I have been with them uh, since 2015. And uh, shortly after um, I started working there, uh, I was given the project of, um, of uh, preparing VHS tapes for digitization. We had just gotten a grant and um, so I wanted to collect everything that we could that could go into this project. Um, what really astounded me and just really took me aback is that when I went to look for these objects, um, they were listed as to draw them up as, you know, for their location. Um, I saw disc, record, film, film strip, tape, video, and cassette. And that's how they were put into the system. Um, so they were spread out all over the place. The, the actual, uh, in our system, the actual description for a VHS tape is videotape, which, you know, really there were maybe two listed in that, that way. And so it really made my job um, just really, uh, I took a lot of time and, and a lot of effort. And so um, that was a really, pro a really a big problem. Um, the forms that I brought um, are um, samples of reports that we can pull up off of our catalog. And our catalog is um, through Past Perfect. And uh, I like the system a lot. I mean, you know, like there are a lot of fields that you can fill out and a lot of, um, ways that you can describe your objects or your library or your archives or whatever. Um, and then you can get these really nifty reports. So um, the first one, report number one, uh, is for um, photographs that were given to us by um, Donato um, uh, Mission. And uh, they, when they closed, we got most of their archive. So on the first one, um, let's see, I, I, can you scroll up a little bit, Amy? Can, can you scroll? Um, well, okay. So as you can see, um, the first thing that I, I <laughs> wanted to show you, huh? I think I'm at the top. Can you yeah, not see can, the top? Yeah, I can see the top, um, but okay. can you scroll up a little bit? So, so scroll down like this way? Yeah, that way. Okay. Okay. As, as you can see, the first thing that I wanted to show you is that the um, person entering this just showed in the description that it was a multiple uh, photos in boxes, which to me doesn't say anything at all. Um, you have to be, you know, pretty descriptive. You've got, if you've got a, a space that will give you uh, a description, the more information that you can fill out in that, the better um, your, the more complete your record will be. So um, in the title, as you can see, Allison James School, um, really that's all you need for your title is Allison James School. Um, Santa Fe can go up into the description. Um, a, a thing that you want to do when you have um, photos in boxes is to pull samples and say, um, were these photos of students? Were they photos of faculty? Were they um, just photos of people that were um, uh, at the school at the time, or were they buildings? I mean, they could have been a uh, description of, of uh, uh, the school building, the classrooms and that kind of thing, whatever. Um, 
the other thing I wanted to show you, if you can see uh, between Allison and James, um, that's not really the name of their school. It's just Allison James School. So, you know, adding little um, dashes or, or um, you know, whatever, asterisks, or uh, it kind of confuses, I think, the, um, you have to be consistent. So um, it's best just to leave that kind of thing out. Um, can you scroll down a little bit more? In our system, um, I don't know about the ones, the, the one that we'll be using for the project, but um, we also have a field called search terms. As you can see, Allison James School, but really all you need is Santa Fe, New Mexico. You don't need Allison James School repeated. So that just confuses the search. I mean, not very many people, they're either gonna uh, search for Allison James School or Santa Fe, New Mexico. So it's best just to um, make that, you know, pretty clear and, 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 and uh, you know, not add extra verbiage. Um, can you go to the slide, uh, slide two? Okay, in this next one, you'll see that in the description, all they do is they did was to put in the size of the frame. Now, again, that doesn't tell the researcher anything. Um, there are other uh, fields where you can describe what the you know the size of the picture and or the photograph, and then what's it what it's encased in, and and you know if you need to just describe the the frame there. Um, go ahead and scroll down a little bit more. Uh, okay, so a little bit more. One way in the search terms that they had to describe uh, Ruth, and it was er, Ruth Barber, okay, um, as a middle-aged teacher at Allison James, that's completely unnecessary. <laughs> and probably you don't wanna put even in the description, middle-aged teacher but you do want to put faculty of Allison James School. Um, again, for search terms, Ruth Barber um, is a search term and Allison James School is a search term, but you don't need teacher at. Okay, so... Um, Let me just add to that by saying that they, their, her name is spelled two different yeah, ways here, right? Barber and Barger. And then there's some typos in here. So again, and, and I mean, no, no shade to the person that did it because we all make mistakes, but th these are kind of the kind of things to watch out for when you're creating your metadata is be consistent. Like Nancy said, use the name, the actual name of the school or whatever, you know, if, if there's a, if there's a standard term, right? Just use the name that the school calls itself and make sure that you are consistent with your spellings and, um, that sort of thing. So, sorry, Nancy, go ahead. No, no, that's okay. Um, misspelling, again, I mean, like if you put in, in your search term, um, Ruth Barber, that's, you know, what you're going to find is her name. It, you're, that way you miss this, this particular record where it's shown as Ruth Barger. So, okay, so I want to go to the third one. I, I don't know, I think this um, one volunteer that was helping us out by entering um, these items into our catalog was not really having a very good day, but this one shows that she put in the description, multiple photos, album, um, size, black and good condition. Again, um, not a suitable description, uh, multiple photos, uh, and then, you know, just say it's you know, people from the school or buildings from the school or whatever. And um, things like um, the size and the color of the album, the album isn't really what people are going to be interested in. Um, but you can put that kind of thing into a different field. And that's uh, really good for your provenance and, and uh, your condition reports. So. Um, if you just, uh, one other thing, if you just scroll down a little bit for this record, 
Um, again, in, uh, a little bit more. For the search terms, um, people are not going to search for Allison James School and Santa Fe. Allison James School, and then a second search term would be Santa Fe, New Mexico. Okay, and then the next one. Yeah, so I'll just chime in on the on that as well to say that um, usually the system that you're using will tell you how to enter separate items, whether you want to put a comma in between or a semicolon or a space or whatever the whatever the system's definition is to indicate that these are two separate search terms and not one big one. So that's just something to be aware of when you're doing uh, subject entries. Okay. And the, the next record. Um, we had somebody entering this record and um, they showed that it was cataloged by NM comma AO. Um, I think probably you want to know um, more, you want to know the actual name of the person that's doing the cataloging because if there's any kind of question that you might have and you need to go back to that person, um, then this to me, uh, it's just like, and probably everybody rec or has had this, this kind of uh, problem come up where you have um, a photograph of multiple people and they're never identified. Well, you know, 50 years later, people aren't going to remember or know who those people are. So just putting in initials uh, is not really suitable. Um, this was an aerial photo of Allison James School uh, campus circa 1950s, and it's a black and white. But if you, uh, if you see, uh, well, and again, it's mis uh, misspelled, received from Ghost Ranch. Okay, Ghost Ranch had purchased the property, but the photo originally belonged to Manal Historical Library according to a sticker on the back. Totally confusing um, description because um, we don't know if it sounds, it begins to sound like the photo was a, a gift from Ghost Ranch, which it wasn't. We don't know if it was led to uh, Ghost Ranch and then returned to Manal uh, Historical Library. And then Ghost Ranch had purchased the property is not pertinent to this um, photograph. So um, you have to be really careful in your descriptions so that people down the road can actually know the exact story of, um, of uh, you know, what the picture really is. Um, circa, uh, down here in the title, um, circa 1950s, isn't necessary. Again, all you need is Allison James School. And um, the circa 1950s, which they did show in the description, um, that is where it belongs. Um, down below, I wanted to show you the search term on this. These are buildings that uh, were part of Allison James School. They did have a SAGE building, Allison James School, the actual classes and and dormitories and the Margaret o Olivia Sage Memorial Building. Those um, also should appear in the description. Um, I think, uh, you know, identifying buildings in an aerial photograph is, is pretty appropriate. Okay, and then the final report that I wanted to show you. Um, again, bad day, multiple photos, green photograph album, but here, um, there is, um, let me see. But here, I mean, it, uh, it doesn't really describe, you know, it's not what you, what the researcher is wanting to look at. I mean, they want to know who the people were and, or the buildings were and, and so on and so forth. For the title, where it shows Alice E. Miller, 1932 to 1936. Alice E. Miller should be identified. Is that a member of the faculty, a student, whatever? 
And it should go into the description, not into the title. Okay, and then down below in the search terms again, uh, Allison James School and Alice e. Miller, the dates of, of her 1932 to 1936, which I, I imagine would either be the tenure for when she was at Alice of James in whatever capacity is not pertinent. So the dates don't even need to be shown um, in that area. And, and that's about all that I, I have in my presentation, so. Um, I think, um, I, coming away from this, you can see that standard language and consistent naming is really important um, when you're, you're thinking about these kinds of records that you're creating. Um, things like uh, punctuation, um, spelling, typographical errors, uh, you know, what are you, what is it that you're describing? Uh, one thing that, that I found in my searches uh, for um, uh, is that, you know, uh, I had some vinyl uh, records. And again, the description, uh, is, is that an object? Is it a, an audio? You know, it, it's, you need to really uh, study what it is that you're entering into the system. So, and then, and kind of go from there. But uh, I think that's yeah, it. And that's, that's why I keep harping on those just those field descriptions because I think that can help you know what to enter into that field and help you think about how to do that in a way that's clear and that's consistent. So I know I I know I keep going back to those forms, but that's why because I hope it helps you. Does anybody have any questions for me or? Okay. Thank you. Well, that, that was really fast, Nancy. I know. <laughs> we didn't show, let me show you my forms. <laughs> you, um, my data I entry would, form. I would, Did you want to there, but, I would throw them up there, but I can't remember where I put them. So, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so do people have sort of general questions about metadata that maybe didn't get answered the last time or if you weren't here the last time? Um, you know, not necessarily specific, specific to what Nancy shared, but just in general. And if not, we'll go and do the, the otter demonstration. I do have a question. Sure. I, okay. Uh, I noticed on some of those forms, a lot of the, of the, um, of the form content wasn't filled in at all on any of the pages. And I'm wondering, is it necessary to have all that if you're not going to use it? Or are some of those items specific to certain types of artifact? Um, well, let's, let's discuss that in the context of the Dublin Core, because I think um, there's a, there are a few differences between what Nancy does and what we're going to do for this project that might get confusing. So let's go to our form. I hope everyone can see the spreadsheet that I'm sharing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to assume you can unless you tell me you can't. Not yet, but um, we'll a second. <laughs> you can see it. Okay. Um, so we haven't, we haven't fully decided yet which of these fields are going to be required. Um, and that's that's always a kind of a double-edged sword, right? Like if you, the more fields you require, the harder a time it is for people to enter things if they don't have information for one of the required fields. But if you leave a lot of them unrequired, then sometimes, you know, you get a lot of photos that maybe just have a title or, you know, one other piece of information. So um, we're, we're gonna have to have some conversations about that for this project, but, um, in general, some of the fields will be required just because you need to have a way for the system to name the thing that you're entering, right? Um, but other than that, no, you don't have to fill in anything that you don't know. And in my opinion, 
it, you know, best practice is not to make things up or not to guess. Um, a lot, one thing that I see a lot is in the date field, people will put unknown or, or under creator, they'll put unknown. And the way that I always think about it is like, it's not unknown. You just don't know, right? Someone somewhere knows who took this picture. You just don't know. So it's better to leave it blank because you might someday know, you might find out, someone might write you an email and say, hey, you know, my aunt took that picture in 19... 69 or whatever. Um, so does that answer your question? I don't see the um, the spreadsheet. Yeah, the form didn't come up after all. Amy, just so you know, it's so still, what, still on the Allison it, James form, the Allison James thing. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can. Um, uh, I thought it would pop up in approximately the same amount of time, but it never did. So. Oh, darn. That. Okay. Yeah. I think that should work. How's that? Let's see. There we go. Okay. Ah. okay. So this is that spreadsheet that's linked in the chat and also on that page on my website. So I hope I hope I answered the question well enough. So you did, thank you. Okay, excellent. The the, the takeaway is fill in as much as you can. Don't make things up and don't put like unknown or question marks or things like that. I think what you're uh, uh, one of the questions about having so much, so many blank fields or whatever is that you starting off with a form, and it all depends on what uh, what it is that you're you're recording into that form. So it could be a record, it could be a, a photograph, it could be any number of different things that is going to require a different uh, set of of answers to the questions. But the form is gonna be a standard form that you can always look at and pretty much know what it is that you're going after so that if it's a standard form, anybody else who's looking at the form is gonna look at it and say, well, this is the, this is, uh, the author or this is who, who uh, uh, published it or whatever it happens to be. Standardization. So um, does anyone else have kind of more general questions, not specific to Nancy's examples or any, any questions at all? There, there was a question in the chat uh, uh -oh. from Claire that was more about the forms. She wants clarity on, on the forms that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, um, oh, so those links are in the chat. They're up at the top. I put them in before we started. The first one is to uh, this page. And then the second one is to this spreadsheet. So Amy, before can, you move to the other please, thing, oh, sorry. Can, could you just, um, hey, this is Brent. Could you just put those links again? I came in a little bit late so that my chat was not from the beginning. I'd appreciate oh, that. Oh, bummer. Okay, sure. Thanks. All right, so here is the spreadsheet. And then here is the metadata explanation page. Thank you, Amy. Sorry, I didn't realize that it wouldn't let you go back if you came in after that's That doesn't make sense. <laughs> OK. All right, did you, Shane, did you have another question? I was just going to ask you to elaborate because I think it would be helpful on what you, you know, what you consider, because we've talked a little about this separately, what you consider essential fields and and why they're essential, because those will be the ones everybody does have to fill out and try to get right. And as we, we talked about, the naming of things is always such a fraught thing because naming is so, you know, uh, yes. powerful. Yes. So anyway, just elaborate on the, what you think will be the ones that we, uh, that are required fields. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, we, there's a, we're gonna have to have a long conversation about that, but for sure title, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed when Nancy was talking is that um, there's, there's probably going to be a little bit of a difference between um, what we create and like our naming conventions versus what she uses, because she's talking about physical objects, right? She's sitting or, or her volunteers are sitting at the desk with the actual physical photo in their hands. 
and, and writing that into the catalog. And what we're going to be doing is working with a digital version, right? Like a scan of something or a photograph of something or um, an electronic document like a PDF, right? Because Manitos is not a physical archive. It's a digital archive. So um, that may affect, for example, your titles where um, in one of Nancy's examples, she was saying, let's just put the Allison James School. And to my mind, because we're going to be dealing with not a box of photos, but each individual photo, I would actually title that image, let's say, stage building Allison James School, because it's just that one item and you know specifically what it is. Um, so that's my two cents on title for today. Um, date is great to have, but I know for historical materials, it can be really hard. You often don't know even like a decade of when this thing was created, let alone the exact specific date. So while it would be nice to require a date, I think that that can limit people from being able to add things if they don't know. Um, so there's that. Um, I think we're gonna have some really interesting ways of using description in this project, which will be different from how uh, maybe sort of more formal, non-community-based archives use the description field. And we were talking about this earlier, and I think we're going to look at using that to tell stories, which is kind of what this project is about. And so I'm, I'm actually really excited to, to have the story of the item or of the people in the photo or whatever in the description. I think that's going to be really an interesting and powerful um, piece of this project. So let's see if I should say anything else. I, if I'm, I'm probably going on too long, but um, <laughs> some of the things that Nancy showed, for example, when um, her volunteers were writing the size of the photograph, that's great information to put in the format field, whether we end up requiring that or not, we probably won't. Um, but what I'm trying to get at here is that there's probably a place for most of the pieces of information that you will have or you will be able to determine. Um, and I tried to pull that out when I wrote the descriptions of each field to help you kind of understand what information should or could, right, go into these fields because I want to look at them as, you know, opportunities rather than limitations. So how's that, Shane? That is great. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Cool. So uh, thanks for taking time to do that, because I know that you would very much like to talk about Otter. And as a huge Otter fanboy myself, as you well know, I'm glad that there's time to be able to talk about Otter, because it's uh, fantastic, particularly for everyone here who knows they're going to be dealing with time-based media, because this is our way of really opening up uh, the ability to search all that time-based media in a way that wasn't like it before. So I'll stop babbling about it in my fanboy way and let you take it from there. Uh, no, I mean, I I love Otter too. I'm just a little worried that it's going to not work the way that I want it to, and I'm going to be embarrassed. But I know this is, the people here are very kind, so you won't laugh at me too hard. Um, so Otter is, it's otter.ai is the website. Uh, Shane, can you put that in the chat? <laughs> And I have used this really only in an experimental way and I love it so far. And I think Shane has more experience. So maybe he'll speak to that um, at some point. But what Otter does is allows you to upload an audio or a video file and it creates a transcript. Now, a couple of caveats. The, uh, the free version of this, anyone can go and create an account. But it does limit you to how much you can upload each month. And I think the limit is like 600 minutes, which is pretty big. Um, but still, uh, they do have a paid version that you can upgrade to to get more features. Uh, the other limitation, which I just found out about today, because I had a radio program by Roberto Mondragon, who I heard someone mention the other day. Um, and I was all excited to get a transcript of it while Otter only does English. So I was very disappointed about that. And you can see in this one, this is a transcript that I, I got, that I made back in January. 
Um, there are some Spanish words in here and it didn't handle them correctly. So you will need to go in and edit probably if you've got um, mixed language items. So those are my two like watch out fors. Um, so what I will do is go ahead and upload something new and we'll see how it works. So I clicked on the home tab and I'm gonna go to import. And I'm gonna try to find the file that I made earlier. Okay. So can everyone see that it's uploading? It's at eight, nine, 10. So it takes a minute. Yes. So now we'll just all sit and twiddle our thumbs while we watch the percent grow. <laughs> and I thought I had made this one pretty small, but I, I really have, I didn't make it small. It's remarkably fast compared to any other tool like it. Like Right. I mean, it's already like more than a third done after 20 seconds. So it's it's pretty impressive. Um, I, have, I have a quick question. Um oh, for go ahead. Shane and you while we're while we're watching this bar. <laughs> um, right. I'm wondering about is there a known tool for Spanish um, transcriptions that we could use? Because in some of our interview cases, there is a lot of you know just mix and code switching sort of, but so in some cases there's long chunks of just Spanish that would be really helpful to you know, have it, um, have it be transcribed. You, are there any resources that could point us in the right direction on that? Um, what, do you, what do you know about, Shane? Anything? Well, uh, uh, in thinking about it, and it's sort of, I don't have a tool offhand that does Spanish particularly well, but like, as I think we did talk about, like it would be a matter of really kind of doing the chunk separate because it's the code switching part that I think really messes with things a lot. So it'll probably be a matter of that. I don't, I don't have, I don't know of a good Spanish one, but it's going to be well worth thinking about. With that caveat of knowing that, you know, our Spanish is in itself different from other kinds of Spanish. So th this will be a, a thing to investigate. Uh, and the other thing I would say is we do know, and we were looking at it today, and ourselves speculating and hoping and dreaming that it's good is that there is a transcription tool module for Omika. We just don't know how well it works right now. So those are the that's the information I have for you right now at the moment. So and see. Google Google does voice recognition in the languages, but it's not user friendly like Otter is. So that's be kind of a bummer. And I realized that while we were uploading, what we should have talked about was a little bit more about why transcripts are important. And I know someone mentioned accessibility, and that's totally true. Um, for people who can't hear, right? They can't hear the oral history, so they would like to be able to read what was said. Um, another reason is that um, if you have the, a text version of it, then it's searchable. So if a researcher is looking for someone talking about a specific topic, they can go right to the point in the, in the transcript where the person talks about that and read what they wrote instead of having to listen to the entire oral history, which might or might not be relevant to the topic that they're researching. So those are my two comments on that. <laughs> um, so you can see that Otter finished uh, um, importing that file. It's telling me I have zero left. I've used up my allotment for the month and money wants me to upgrade, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna click done. And then I'm going to go to my conversations and it will usually tell me if it's still processing. Look at that, it's already done. It already created the transcript. So obviously there's gonna need to be some editing, right? Because it's not perfect. But if we, it has this nice little integrated player right here so you can play your audio and you probably, I don't know how well this will work over Zoom, but. Well, um, 
didn't know this a while ago, but I can actually tell my Taylor Jimmy family a lot of so that's just kind of a snippet of how that works, which is so cool because it goes along word by word. You can watch, and when you find a mistake, which there are some, right? You can come in here. No, but I can't actually film it. There were a lot of them. I think maybe I have to click edit first, and they can't see everything because of all the zoom control. Here we go. Here's the edit button up at the top. And so I can go in and edit the text, make it match the audio. I can also edit the speakers to put in the names. Like this is gonna be Diane, who's the interviewer. And then this is Andrew. And then you can go through the whole thing. I mean, I, I, this is just the very beginning of, of a like 30 minute interview. Um, but you know, it would go speaker one, speaker two. And once you edit the name one time, then it puts in for speaker one, it'll substitute Diane every time, which is very cool. Um, so that's kind of the basics of Otter. You can see it's like super easy to use and the results are pretty good. I mean, it does, it does need some editing, but it's much easier than having to type it all out yourself. Um, so questions, comments, thoughts? Shane, do you have, I have a question only because I forgot, but you might've noticed because you were playing with it recently. Uh, and it's relevant to the archival thing and it's a thing for everybody to think about in, re in regards to their, um, to their transcripts. So if what we're looking at, is, at as this as is, um, you know, a way to put a transcript into the archive, uh, what that means is taking these transcripts and making them into OCR or optical character recognition searchable documents. Do you know if Otter does that within Otter or is it something we're going to yes. have to take? Okay. Yes, look at this. So you go up here and you click export text and it exports out the transcript. I'm assuming to a text file, I haven't tried it. But once you have the text, you can put it in a Word document, make it could look pretty, print it to a PDF, or we probably could copy and paste it into that description field, especially if it's not too long. So, so again, if someone's searching for someone talking about a specific topic, then if that text is in the description and she talks about, like she's talking about camphor here, I'll come for, and if they're looking for information on that, then this will pop up in the search, which is fabulous. Thank you for mentioning that, Shane. I meant to bring it up and I forgot. In fact, let's export it. Why not? Ooh, look at all the options. So it gives you, um, Word or PDF format right out of Word and It gives you the option to include or not include certain aspects. And then here's your text down here. And then, oh, look, I don't know if you can see that, but down at the bottom, it popped up a text file for me. And there it is. Great. So I can paste that into Word. I can paste it into this description field. I'm so excited i'm crazy excited about this i love it yeah so with with the caveats that i said at the beginning so it's not going to work for everything but for um pretty simple short ish oral history where it's people talking um one that i tried to do had music and that didn't work very well it doesn't you can't <laughs> hear people talking over music so if you've got like background noise or whatever then it's probably going to have more trouble but but again i mean you can edit it so now this form is available on your website. Um, what form? The, the, this application you were using. So this is called Otter. It's at otter.ai is the web address. Yeah. Anybody right. could find it. Yeah, yeah it's in the chat. It, it's in oh. the chat, not, and not as a link. I couldn't make it make it in a link, but just <laughs> copy and paste where it says www.otter.ai and it should take you to Otter. Yeah. Right. And then you, you have to create a, an account. Of, oh, it's, it's free. Okay. But once okay. you create an account, then you can import your audio files, uh, you know, a certain number per month and do go through this process. And, and it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty easy to use. So I'm excited. So that's pretty much what I had. Do people have other questions? I have, a, um, I have another question. <laughs> this is Claire again. I'm sorry. I have a lot of audio stuff. So this is like a, I'm really really excited about this topic and I just made a um I just made an account and it looks like one I guess comment is it looks like maybe you have to go pro to upload pre-recorded um 
files. It looks like you can, did, did you, were you, it looked like you were just uploading and you have a free account? Yeah. Okay, I wonder if this is a new thing. You know, if you signed up and you're grandfathered into an older version because I'm looking at their, you know, basic. It says record and transcribe live, search and playback recordings, highlight and insert, and then the pro version says everything in basic, import pre-recorded files. So oh, that's strange. So when you yeah, click on your on your home option, it doesn't have this import option up at the top. Yeah, let me look and see. Oh, it does. Huh? That's weird. Yeah, it's a, it lets yeah. me do it. Don't believe the marketing. <laughs> oh, that, oh man, those tricky mofos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, so, so, I got it. I got it. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm glad I asked that dumb question. Because oh, no, start, there's no dumb questions. That's I awesome. was starting to get. And then my other question is, once we have that and we've done the hopefully a good job of actually going through it and making it, um, you know, more, more legible and um, accurate, where in relation to each record, does this go within it? Is there a place for a transcript or is this going to be another separate record that gets you know its own delineation within a format so say we upload our audio file and you know it's a longer file it's an it's an hour say as an interview and um we have a transcript of it how do those two interact and how do they relate to each other so that's a great question um it, it depends on so so my guess at this point because i haven't tried it my guess is that if your file is pretty long the, the transcript is gonna be longer than what you wanna put in the description field. Hopefully the system would let you do that, but it might not be ideal for the user to have like pages and pages and pages to scroll through. Um, so you could do that text export that I showed and then create like a PDF or a Word document. And in Omeka, you can attach additional items, right? So, so you're gonna fill in your metadata and attach your audio file, but you can also attach the PDF or whatever the document is that has the transcript in it. Okay. And we're also talking about potentially getting to use something called the oral history metadata synchronizer. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that, but what that does is it provides a view so that the oral history or the whatever it is, the video or audio document or uh, sound file is on the screen with the transcript and it puts timestamps into the transcript so that a person can search the transcript, find the topic they're interested in, click on that timestamp and go right to that spot in the audio. So for like an hour and 30 minute interview to be able to go to like 42 minutes and 15 seconds and hear the, the topic that you're interested in, for a researcher that's like a fantastic ability to not have to listen to that whole interview to get you know the the three minutes where they talk about the the desired topic um so again i don't know how that all is going to play out but that's something that we're talking about and we hope we're going to be able to to make it work technologically speaking and, and claire clara ideally right so that pdf right um ideally and again this is a technical question we need to see what the tool does before we know what it is that pdf has an optical character recognition layer that might be an export that is if you have a paid account which i do have but i haven't looked at it in a while and i can't look at it right now uh to either do that or it's easy to create an ocr layer in something like a pdf editor like an adobe whatever their new PDF thing's called. Uh, and what that will do is if that is now in there as its own sort of independent item, though linked like Amy just said to it, it should be searchable by a search field. So then your transcript with its OCR layer will come up in searches for whatever is in that transcript. So unlike how it used to be where you had to manually put in keywords because you listened to your whole interview and knew what the keywords were, it should be able to automatically find it assuming that you corrected your transcript and corrected your OCR to accurately reflect, reflect what's in, in your recording. So, okay. Yeah. So that would be an a big advantage potentially to a pro account with this, but if not, you know, if it's outside of financial means or something, then maybe we could look at, uh, there could be some little more investigation into 
OCR that, layer. That would, just, that would just automate it. OCR, I think, is automatically available in whatever Adobe thing you might have to edit a, okay. to create a PDF okay. anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask one more follow-up question? When you brought up the time stamping, um, as a interviewer, I usually try to, that's like, you know, the note taking thing that I try to do. It's, I probably don't have, it's not standard. Maybe I'm not doing standard things, but trying to at least make timestamps as, as we do interviews. Is that something that would be added then to the description? Would that be a valuable thing to add? Um, probably what so, so minus um, something like the oral history metadata synchronizer that would automate that, um, probably the researcher would look at the, at the PDF or the whatever file the transcript is in, look at your timestamp and then go to the audio. And that, that in itself is super helpful. At speaking as someone who has tried to do that, even if you're not exact, you know, even if you're like 30 seconds off or whatever, it's so much better to have an idea of where to go than to sort of have to drag that handle and listen. Nope, that's not it. Drag it more. Oh, no, not there yet. Oh, went too far. Drag it back. That's so irritating. <laughs> so I think that's a great practice if you if you can do it and it doesn't have to be perfect. It's it's, you know, anything we can do to help people access this material in the way that they want is a plus in my book. Thank you. You are making a great case for the oral history synchronizer. Well, I'm hoping. I'm hoping we can get it. I don't know. I don't know. I've never worked with it, so I don't know how hard it is to set up, but we'll see. So, so other questions, thoughts? If you have lots of questions, Claire, I would say go to town. Don't be shy if you got them, because I know that this is a, a thing that you have a lot of experience with. And so any observations or anything that more questions you have is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have one right away, but I'm thinking. Okay. Here. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Are, are there any other questions about that or metadata generally or anything? Hey everybody, this is Brent. Hey Brent. Um, I had a, just a, maybe a general question about metadata for, let's say, um, I'm scanning uh, a notebook, a handwritten notebook. And so this would be concerning the date. And I was thinking how some of the entries in the notebook have a very specific date, whereas others don't have a date. And I wondered, I'm not quite sure. So like, I wondered if I should put the date, put a date on there that's a kind of close to one that's actually marked in the notebook, or would I leave it blank if if that particular page doesn't have a date attached to it? So this the notebook was written, I think, between 1936 and 1940. And so I thought, could I put a range, you know, as the date, just like everything was written in between these four years? Um, yeah, and just I maybe some thoughts about that. If you're if you're gonna upload the the whole notebook as one item, then I would mm -hmm. use the range. If you're gonna upload each page as as an item, then you could put the date on the pages that have a date. And if you if that page doesn't have a date, then you can leave the date field blank. If it's okay. not required, which I hope we're not gonna do. Okay. Yeah, but However. I just thought, and just about about being accurate too. I wanted just to represent the material accurately. Um, where I can and not make like large any generalizations, right? And try to extend anything. So yeah, thank you. But Annie. it's nice that you have. I mean, you have a date range, right? Because you have the first page and the last page, hopefully, or, or right. the second and last page, and they have dates. So so you yeah. can come up with a pretty accurate range. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Great. Cool. Thank you, Amy. Sure. Thank you. Well, does it does anyone have any other questions or anything that they want to talk about in in relation to anything that you heard today or otherwise? I have one more question, not about the audio as much, but the um, you're referencing the required fields versus the optional fields, and um, what are the what are the parameters in terms of how you're thinking about about that? You know, and I can understand why you would want to have certain 
certain fields like a title <laughs> and a description and you know so there's a basic bare bones but um, just curious about what's directing the decision about that a little bit I don't know if we even know I, I mean we have to have something for the database to kind of hang that item onto so usually that's a title um, and my my concern with requiring only a title is that, um, you know, and, and you can see this in some of what Nancy shared with us earlier, right, is that you're going to have a range of, of um, quality, right, in the, in the titles that people create. And if all you have is a title and it's not a very good title, then that's not ideal. And the more stuff you have in there that kind of only has a, a sketchy title that doesn't tell the person much about what the image is or the item, um, then that makes your archive not that useful because people don't know, you know, they, they're putting in specific search terms. And if it just says, for example, like some of Nancy's things, if it just says Allison James School and they're looking for a particular building or a particular faculty member or whatever, then that photo or you know the item won't show up in the search because it doesn't meet because they're looking for Ruth Barber's you know photo. So those are some of the concerns that I have with you know limiting the the number of required fields. But then you know if you have too many, then you're sort of locking people out when they don't have the information that you're asking for. So it's it's going to be a delicate balance, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, something that came to mind as as we were talking and just the tiny bit of experience that we had with the with the sandbox run was um, that with internet in rural places sometimes large files like we actually can't upload them you know like I ended up uploading mp3s instead of wave files for some of our recordings or um, you know like we even had problems with a, you know trying to upload a really high resolution scan you know um, and so a question then is providing those, all of those in a chunk for someone else in another location, like a designated person to batch upload them. And then somehow there's a system set up so that we could then enter the metadata. You know, so I was wondering if that's also a consideration that's being taken into account so that like that batch uploader would be able to only enter certain fields, you know, some, because of our rural, context and many of us e even with um shane and i had a discussion about this that even with supposed fiber optics your download speed is usually much faster than your upload speed yes. you know because it's like a not exactly a one-way street but almost so it's like a once we really start trying to do it it was like oh my god you know and i was like going to all these different places that i thought had fast internet and it was the same problem you know so yeah, and I've read into that on UNM's system, so it's definitely, I mean, it can happen anywhere, anytime. It just depends on the, the infrastructure, right, or the, even, like, traffic. Like, if the network's really busy, sometimes it'll time out on a really big, like, an MP4 video file or something. Right. So, yeah, that's definitely, um, we've, we've got, I think, a bunch of different ways um, that we're going to be able to um, get things from people and help with uploads. So yeah, we are definitely taking that into consideration. Awesome. I, I think one thing that's really great about what you brought up, Claire, is the necessity for as much as we, you know, love that this technology can do things and that there's more options technology wise to do things, that we can't lose sight of the fact that, you know, I think that there's a lot of aspect about this project that is really a what what it really is about is about it's a network of people to do this and build this and so to me you highlight a thing which is if there's not like a technology solution where you are and what you're at that this is the importance of building a network so that if say you're in a place that can upload a bunch of stuff you can get stuff in some very human solution to a place where it can be uploaded and that this is a a thing that we can't lose sight of is that you know, we have to, as Amy just said, is we have to have a sort of an array of creative solutions to make sure we accomplish what we need to accomplish, whether those are technological or human solutions. So I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. Yeah, 
And I'm going to date myself now by saying, I don't know if other people remember back in the day, we used to call it sneaker net where you took, you know, a disc and nowadays it would probably be a USB drive to, you know, from one computer to the other. So, you know, that's, that's still a thing. We still have sneakers. Yeah, totally. That's what, that's what I just did with a collaborator. You know, we literally, I had Amazon send him a thumb drive. So, and then I met him on the highway and got the thumb drive from him, you know, so that I could upload stuff. Yeah. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you everybody so much. And I really appreciate all of the, you know, sparking questions. And um, as again, if you um, have questions, you can always email me. Uh, my website has a contact form on it. And let's see, can I put my, um, if I can find the chat, maybe I can put my email address in there again. Here we go. So don't hesitate if you have questions and, you know, I'm, I think everybody knows Shane too and he's great and always willing to help. So I am always here through various, various forms. So, yeah. So really various forms. I'm going to have to ask you about that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. It's, uh, it's complex. Uh, but yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, and thank you, Nancy, for, I mean, uh, I really appreciate your examples of stuff because it's really helpful to see in reality what some of these situations look like. And I know as yours, like you and I talked about, it it's, uh, can be very complicated, especially when you have multiple people kind of inventing things, new ways of doing things even within one organization. So thank you for, for highlighting that and bringing that to us. A couple of brief announcements, which is of course, this series will continue to go and we really appreciate everybody coming and participating because this is how we're gonna build our skill sets and our network. Uh, you will probably be hearing from us shortly about a variation on the event because we've had a lot of requests for everybody to be um, familiar with what everybody else is doing. So we're, we will be, you'll be hearing about us from that shortly as well as what the next of uh, the Platica series is. So again, thanks everyone for coming and participating and learning. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll see you all next time. Oh, and if you do need a recording for this for any reason, just call me directly and I will retransfer it to you. Uh, and the last one as well, if you need it. So just let me know what, what you need and we'll figure that out. So thanks again. And thank you, Amy and Nancy. Yep. Yeah. Okay, bye everybody. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.